I think I'm pretty Smurf. sure Derek Bailey said many things that he would like to retract. <laughs> Actually, he probably would like to, but it's whether or not we take it seriously. Um, but yeah, it, it's it, it's it's a it's a good line, but I think if anybody can we can can put up a violent opposition to it, these guys can. So. Well, I think I mean the saxophone has the associated with a jazz tradition, but we I think work intentionally hard to sort of try and not have it sound like it came from that tradition. And, per and perhaps, you know, over the years, it's, uh, you know, dipped back into it at times. But uh, it was never about trying to pursue any particular genre or idea, just try to make music that we enjoyed making and that we were satisfied with, that we felt was pushing music into some different direction. Well, I, w I would say, in answer to Derek Bailey, um, Marcel Mule, the famous classical saxophone player, mm -hmm. sax saxophonist. He clearly was not a jazz player, so that blows his theory, right? Mm -hmm. So was there... Was well, actually, just, just to, 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 to comment as a non-saxophone player, though, also, is to say that nobody has probably taken the saxophone to a more uh, extreme mm, language... Uh, they, they basically invented their own vocabulary for this stuff, and it really transcended the uh, established vocabulary of everybody through jazz, all the way through like Eiler and mm -hmm. and even early Brooksman. And it, Evan Parker was kind of like broke out into his own vocabulary. These guys broke out into their completely separate own vocabulary, and uh, that was what actually I was doing the same thing on the guitar, mm -hmm. which is why we melded so well together. Mm -hmm. But it was the extension of vocabulary as a big deal of free improv, I know, and certainly was a discipline that we've adhered to. Mm -hmm. But um, <laughs> nobody has taken the saxophone as a prepared instrument more seriously, for example, than these than these two. Well, I mean, was there a death when you guys got together in '79? Was there any kind of ever articulated aesthetic of what you were going to do? Did you ever sit down and say we're going to? we're going to take this balls to the wall approach to free improvisation further or was there ever any kind of d deliberate aesthetic or um, when you decided what Burby and Vegas were going to do or was it a very organic very would say organic. Well, right. we've developed we were all right we were all we were all ripe ripe absolutely <laughs> ripe we'd all been going that way on our own um, I mean, these guys obviously have been working together for some time previous to meeting me um, and they can talk about how they developed that, but I sort of had been, to an extent, on my own. I've been working with a lot of people in, in New York City at the time where I lived, but um, none of it was really gelling into any way that I liked. Um, I had sort of been pushed out into my own, and I worked on my own on a sound for a very long time and was ready to meet these guys, and it just, you know, it was uh, prompt criticality. Mm. You know? <laughs> Yeah, right. <laughs> Fission reaction, boom! It just happened as soon as we began playing. And well, let's talk a little bit. Um, I mean, Don and Jam, you basically grew up together. That's true. If you've ever seen, I don't know if anyone's ever seen the cover for the Bales Together record, which is a really cute picture of uh, <laughs> oh, uh, <laughs> Jam and Don when we were kids together, which is very nice. So, you want to tell us a little bit about how you two began making music together then? Well, we played in school bands all through school. Um, uh, through grade school, middle school, high school. We were in the high school marching bands. Then uh, I went off to university and uh, Don went to school in the city. And then when, we, when I came back, I mean, I brought back some ex exposure to people that we hadn't heard. I mean, I, I didn't hear Isla until I went off to university. Oh, yeah. And it was like, this was, was a revelation because this is like what we had been, we had been doing somewhat Naively, or but without you, you were aware, awareness, you were aware of free jazz, but you hadn't checked out things like Coltrane and Ewer. Actually, or? not. No. I mean, where where Jim and I were living, which is in a, a very extremely white suburb of New York, uh, there was no opportunity. For, I mean, I think in a lot of ways, uh, the mothers of invention were in, were very crucial to the development because we didn't have access to free jazz. Right. I mean, there are, I think our first exposure to modern music was through Frank Zappa. Right. For better or worse, that was the only thing that was available. I mean, you know, on the covers, you know, he quotes Varese. Yeah, right. And so I, before I heard free jazz, I actually heard Varese. Um, 
and, and actually, to go back a step to what you were asking earlier, in anticipation of this this uh, interview, I started thinking about you know exactly that question: How long have we been preparing to, before Borbito and so forth? And actually, we were Jim and I were playing bells together literally fifty years ago. So we. So how did that develop? Was this? How did you? How did this? Just the explanation. I don't know if you don't if you have never seen Barbie makers or know about them. One of the techniques that uh, uh, Jim and Don have kind of pioneered is bells together, where they lock the horn of their saxophones together and create this sort of circular general sound. Was that something you guys just stumbled across? Just out of exploring the possibilities of the instrument. Just play, a playful exploration, really. Well, it is playful, and it's funny because I think a lot of people talk about the music of Burby and Magus as being um, quite forbidding and quite aggressive. But really, when you see the bells together thing, I mean, it's actually quite intimate. And it, it, it almost could only have been born of people who knew each other for a very long time. It's a very intimate process of locking the horns. Yeah, you, you know, I'm not sure that I'd be comfortable doing it with just anyone. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> I think we were discussing the ramifications of that just a little while ago. <laughs> Indeed. It's true. You have to watch who you do this technique with. <laughs> so can you explain a little bit about the Bells Together technique then? Well, uh, that, that's, that's it basically, but then what happens is the two saxophones create the sound chamber, which we're then able to manipulate with our embouchure. Uh, well, the open thing, fingerings. The, the pressure. The, the, there is an interface where the, the two sounds meet, and at that 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 interface, it sets up a certain tension, and it, it, the, the music starts to or the sound starts to shimmer. And what happens is, that's assuming all the, the horns are completely com all the keys are compressed, so the, the, the air can't get out. Right. Now, if you open a key, one key on the top of the stack of one horn. What'll happen is that'll push the sound in further into that horn. You've opened up a, a, a release valve of sorts up top, so the sound, the air now comes further into that horn. The space is more compressed, and it'll have an impact on on the sound. Uh, if you open up a key on the other horn, that'll start to bring the sound back towards that horn, and as it comes back, it starts to disrupt. Right. Um, and, and to further, and that's assuming that you're playing two of the same horns, two altos, two tenors, two baritones. It further complicates things if you have two dissimilar horns, an alto and a tenor, tenor and a baritone, that sort of thing. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a little bit more complex. Or you can just go at it and just, <clears throat> and see what happens. Mm -hmm. Now you guys haven't done like different saxophones for a long time. You know? Well, it's 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 easier to tour with just one horn. And you, you also almost have to the way that the airlines control. A the actually, this technique was documented by Hugh Davies, uh -huh. who we have we played with back in the early '80s um, in the Grove Dictionary of Music because he uh, saw this as in a, almost a new instrument. The bells together yeah, that was yeah, a new yeah, instrument yeah. on its own. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. It was. Uh -huh. Well, you've always been big on sort of augmenting and changing the saxophones as well. There's also the use of the long tubes that right. you use. What, 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 what does that do for the sound? Well, it lowers the register, brings it almost down to like a bass clarinet. Yeah, it changes sound. the timbre of the instrument. Right. It's, it's a more woody bass clarinet is a, is a good comparison. It's a very and woody, it, low, and the, the, the didgeridoo grew, kind of basically sound. Basically grew out of just experimenting with things that you could do with with the saxophone or with with things lying around the house or garage, you know. But I mean, early on you were you were certain, although we've established that Barbie makes are not a jazz band as such, but early on there were quite a lot of connections with a lot of free jazz players at the time. And I think maybe at the time when Barbie and Megas formed, it's like late 70s, early 80s, was a very interesting period of flux in the music in general. The kind of great revolutionary period of free jazz was perhaps at an end. Oh, yeah. But what was happening though was free jazz was almost kind of like cross-breeding with uh, rock music, Avon Rock. So we had this period, probably Barbie and Megas and the Blue Humans, which is another group that you were involved with, were probably the two groups that were key in terms of this changeover, this infecting of rock music by free jazz, perhaps. I... You might be overestimating our impact. I think that was just sort of done naturally. We happened to play a lot of those gigs, and we 
were greeted with the usual <laughs> reaction by everyone. Uh, so I, and uh, you'd have to ask Rudolph about you know his own his his his, his rea the reactions that he received as well. Well, I mean, I think I, I remember what's that the college music uh, we, CMJ CMJ. So we played with the on the same bill with the Blue Humans, and you know he's Rudolph plays with a drummer. People ha can relate to drums in any fashion, even if it's free drumming. Yeah, he played with people like Beaver Harris and things who played with Albert Aylor, also played with the Blue, hu Blue Humans. And just to underline, Rudolph Arthur Gray. Doyle. Yeah, we're, yeah, Arthur Doyle. We're talking Rudolph, Rudolph Gray, who was a guitarist, who was a member of Red Transistor and the Blue Humans. He also wrote the book about Ed Wood that the Tim Burton movie was actually based on mm -hmm. as well, just for some information on Rudolph so, Gray. So that, that one evening, Rudolph and the Blue Humans played among some other groups. And then we came on, <laughs> and and the sound guy literally pulled the plug on us five minutes, not maybe five minutes into the performance because they just couldn't handle it. Wait, so the blue humans were acceptable, but Borby and Negus was a bridge too far. Because yeah, guitar drums. Lack of rhythm. Is that what you think it is? Does rhythm rationalize? I, I, I just think, or? in, in I think part, but we, perhaps we had this problem a lot. I mean, the, it's the, <laughs> the music has a sense of scale, meaning that it sounds bigger than in fact it is. And I think that's because there's no associative element to lock your senses on, no drums. I mean, everything is abstracted to the point where there's, there, it, it seems threatening to the uninitiated ear. We played, um, an, another concert I'll, I'll reference was we played in CBGB's canteen. Uh, we couldn't get a gig at the main, the main theater. And again, at that point, we were playing what we, we are calling uh, the monolith. We had a very large sun amp, and all three of us were plugging. It was like, it was like the, the 2001 Space Odyssey. <laughs> the, the monolith. <laughs> monolith. <laughs> and, and we were, so again, kind of like the bells together were the, were the, the sound interfaces. So now here we have three extremely distorted sound sources coming through one speaker box. Yeah. And the sound was... It, it became ultimately difficult to control, so we, we ditched that after a while. But at the time, it was really working for us. So we had this one monolithic speaker, all three sounds sort of fighting, fighting to gain dominance wow. over each other. And again, maybe five to ten minutes into the performance, they pulled the plug on us because the performance in the main space felt threatened by what we were doing. Now, we only had one... Well, we were too loud. We, only, <laughs> we, were, too we, loud. we were too loud. Again, it, addre it, it addresses my earlier statement about the music having scale, meaning it seems larger, more massive than, in fact, it really was in reality. So because of that, that sense of scale, the main group, who I think was Danzig. Yes, that's the punchline. <laughs> Danzig said and, and that so we they've were got... bleeding over across the wall and interfering with their set. Now they've got <laughs> true, they've got true vocal PA, <laughs> mic drums, Danzig. bass amps, guitar amps, wow. and all we have is one one amp. But I would say we part of why Total they shut us down is not just because we didn't have a drummer, but it's also because of what sounds and what range with the instruments we were exploring at that level too. So it was asking a lot, but, but we always they ask weren't prepared. We ask a lot, but they weren't prepared to deal well, with it. Well, let's talk about the first Barbie and Meg's album came out in 1980. Yeah. And I remember like you, the, was your, your distributor sent a bunch of promo copies to various musicians and artists. And oh no, that was you, a friend of ours. Right. And you got some pretty interesting a reactions. Great, a, like, a great unpaid, man, a, a great unpaid Hank manager, Berkman. Hank Berkman. We're a long time friend and champion of the group. Right. Perhaps, perhaps the first fan of the group. Because he actually, Donald was... Perhaps, for a long even, time, maybe the only fan. Even, <laughs> right, even, even before the, the first record came out, Donald had a radio show at Columbia University. So periodically he would pepper his broadcast with choice recordings that, that the three of us had made. And so one of those was, a, was something that we recorded in 79, which subsequently was released, released on our Black album. Which the was the, Room. The third album. And... And Hank, I guess, was a fan of Don's show, and he called the station.
to tell him, hey man, what Who was that? that? What was that you just played? Wow. And at that point, he became an instant fan. And that was even before the first record and came out. Hank is a, a character who always had WKCR on him. He had it on 24 hours a day in his apartment. Whether they were doing shows that he couldn't even stand, but he faithfully had it on him. He was an avid listener. So he sent out records to various people. He did and a he lot of records. He's a collector. He grew right. up in Holland and had moved to the States but maintained contacts with everybody in the... They were in, it was interested in free jazz and then all the new, the free improv players as they were coming up. And he maintained personal lighting contacts with them. He was a habitual letter writer. And well, so he in, in, a free he internet, in a pre-internet society, that's how one, of, one of the solutions to sharing information and, and as quickly as possible was this, this core group of, uh, hardcore group of music enthusiasts from mostly in Europe and the States form these sort of letter writing and record exchanges. So you, they'd find, if one of them found a record that really turned them on, they'd buy a, a bunch of copies and send them out with, with cover letters to all their friends. Brilliant. And they would do this, they would all reciprocate with each other. Well, he's a huge this collector, is, too, so is, he would is use the them to trade with right. people for this. <laughs> Literally. This is how it was done back when you were, you know, a lot of you were probably before you were born, but anyway. So and you got, some in, you got some very interesting reactions from that, though I believe one of your earliest fans was Massimi Akita from Merzbau. That's, that's right. I received high impact from Borbido Magus. I received high impact. Brilliant. Well, he had, he had found it in a record store himself in, in, in Japan. In Japan. Wow. And he was attracted to the cover and the instrumentation. And he thought it looked interesting enough that he bought it. And then he wanted to know where where this came from and what, what was this about. And then he reviewed it for a magazine in Japan and that introduced us to a Japanese audience. So when did you first become aware of sort of Japanese noise and did you immediately feel a kinship with what was happening in Japan? I don't, I, Later I don't think that, yeah. the, this whole concept of noise came out Probably in the late 80s, I want to say. Yeah, 80s to early 90s, perhaps. Yeah, when it there, was no, there was no noise movement, per se, at that point. There was, you know, there were lots of fanzines. There were, there, there were many compilations. We were getting requests constantly to participate in comp compilations, most of which we declined because the quality of, of the work was, and presentation was so sort of cheap and, or pornographic. And pornographic, which didn't do much, did, frankly, didn't do anything for me. Uh, like that was a big part of the sort of graphic presentation yeah. of the early Japanese noise, was, was, wasn't it? And it was it, all, it, it, was, a, it was industrial. Yeah, yeah, That yeah, was right. the big thing uh -huh. at that point. Um, and, and, I mean, speaking personally, I, I couldn't relate to it musically uh, or culturally. I just, just, I don't know. So well, who did you relate to? Was it any contemporaries? I mean, what about groups like Nemo Mo? <laughs> And things like that in New York. No, I mean, De Demo Mo actually later. was much was later. That was in the mid eighties. Mm -hmm. um, matter of fact, Adam Nodelman turned us on to them. He had a cassette that someone had given him. He'd seen them in the East Village, and I remember we were driving in a car and thinking, "Wow, this this is quite like nothing I'd I'd ever heard or we'd ever heard before." So, but no, what we're talking about are things like. Um, so a lot of these industrial spin-offs, uh, like you know, throbbing gristle junior type groups. In fact, um, someone actually had given me a copy, loaned me a copy of it, Industrial Records, mm -hmm. a, a compilation of, of uh, Genesis uh, P. Origins favorite bands, I guess. Mm -hmm. And it kind of, and this was within the last two weeks. And it sort of brought me back to these compilations from the early 80s and just how really boring <laughs> and banal <laughs> this stuff really kind of was. It was very dark and, and sort of uh, ambient or, mm -hmm. or it just really, <laughs> again, it just reminded me why we didn't take, why we didn't participate in all of these uh, compilations at that time. But then despite the protestations of it not being a jazz group, you were closer with jazz musicians. I mean, you worked with people like Peter Kowald and things like this, so you did have more of a connection perhaps to European free improvisation. Also via a group Voice Crack, Norbert Mosslang, who's playing later today, was part of a duo Voice Crack. 
that Berbita might make us collaborated with several times actually as well. Yeah. So yeah. perhaps your closest links was with European free improvisation. Would that be correct? No, I think I think it was we were fortunate to meet people that were as serious about what they did as we were. I think my objection to a lot of this industrial stuff is it seems more <laughs> cultural than musical. It, it, yes, there there's less of an interest in what you're creating um, than how you look while you're creating it to a great degree. And I think that damages... A, I think there's a great deal of that. Obviously, there are some really good people working in it who are very, very concentrated. And yeah, I mean, I think... The but for the most part, it is part of a presentation mm -hmm. lifestyle sort of, 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 of package. And, it's, and, and that's and not what we're doing at all. And we're Peter all, Kovold is a master, mu is master musician at the time. And so you learn from being around people who are serious about their music. The problem for, with most people is that you know, what we do, of course, is like so far off the table of, of charted Western music that, um, and a lot of charted Eastern music that there is no reference point. And uh -huh. there's obviously an, assumption, an automatic lowest common denominator assumption that we are just picking up our instruments for the first time and turning stuff up as loud as possible, and that's all that we're doing. All three of us are trained musicians, and this is what separates us, you know, from like the little kids. We come at this actually as trained fucking musicians. All right, we know exactly what we are fucking doing. We are doing it with malice aforethought. <laughs> do not be, uh, do not do do not have the wrong impression. We know what we are doing, and we are doing it very very specifically. So, and that separates us, I think, from a lot of, again, a lot of the, a lot of the pack. I, I, think I, I would say that's absolutely true, even if we don't know what we're doing. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think sometimes because of the sort of, the, the nature of the wall of sound the board you make is sometimes, and that the individual contributions can blur into each other. And so sometimes it can be hard to break down the base, the instrumental contribution of each, because it's very much like one sound a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. And some would say that's the strength of it, too. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh -huh. that it's one voice at times. Uh, three, three people uh -huh. and one voice. So how, how, how has the, the sound or the music evolved over the years from playing together? Are you able to say how it's evolved? Has it evolved? No, how would you describe it? We like to think that um, that's what our discography reflects. In fact, I, that was a... That was one of our big aims when we started the record company, was this would be a way of documenting all the different changes. And that was when we would decide to release something on our own label, Agaric, uh, when we had done something very special, or there had been a shift or the right. change that we wanted to document this far down the road. Occasionally it would be just a great collaboration, or occasionally somebody would be like, oh yeah, this was just a stinking great gig, let's put this out too. But um, that was the purpose of the record mm -hmm. company, was to give you that long timeline. Right. I'm, not, I'm not making a pitch ad to buy our CDs or anything like that, but if, for example, that one w would be one way of, of, of going. The first album, to me, you know, sounds very much like a band. Right. Not like a voice, like a band. And they're very, very unique. You will never hear another band like that around. The only things I can think of is like like early Floyd or the Magic Band in terms of Early Floyd? Really? You would compare No, the no, first no, no. I'm not comparing. Floyd? I am not comparing. I'm just talking about how unique. You mean with like they had a unified band sound? Is that what you're talking it's about? It's just yeah, it's a completely unique and I mean I'm thinking of rock bands just because they sort of come to mind as Models, right? I, there is no reference to rock and roll really in there. They just cut. That's. I, I'm just using them. I'm just using that as a facility. But it really does sound like a working. You know, it's, a, it's a working unit, but it's a multifaceted unit, and it sounds like, again, like a band. From there on, it begins to become a sound. For example. That's a good point. Right, and that's also because I mean, in a way, it's the classic lineup. I mean, you stayed at the same lineup yeah. since nineteen seventy nine, which is pretty remarkable. I mean, how the hell have you managed to stay together without killing each other? I know it's come close. Yeah. At points. 
Or is it because it's worth it? <laughs> no, <laughs> the one wants to engage with that one. Well, I, I know the reason why it, it stayed together is because we still love the music we make together. I mean, that's the that's the payoff, you know. Yeah. I mean, it's no, yeah, let's go back. no three you, people make the music that yeah. we do. Yeah, well, I'm just I'm just sitting yeah. here earlier and talking about the first time that we played together well, off of your first question, and yeah, it was a sort of there was this like it's magic. Uh, <laughs> And, and, and another another thing that has been said about our music is some people would criticize it and say it sounds like they're playing the same song over and over and over. But if you listen to the records and, and you really can hear what's going on, you do hear the evolution. You hear yeah. that it is not that at all. I mean, it's this the the criticism for that is somebody would say the same thing about like Beethoven or Mozart or, or oh yeah, it's just all the same Cecil stuff Taylor. or Cecil Taylor. yeah or oh, the same, or whatever it's all the same yeah, yeah. crap yeah. Mm -hmm. from his first record to the last it's just the same fucking like you know and <laughs> <laughs> well there have been other members can we talk a little about you brought him up Adam Adam Nodelman for a while was a bass player with Burby Amagus as well. That's very true. Yeah, can you tell us a little bit about him? I believe he was a kid when he first became he was a he was a He was a teenager, and some younger friends of mine, much younger friends of mine, <coughs> brought him to my attention and said, you got to check this kid out. He's a hardcore bass player, but I think, I think he'll have... I think you'll really like what he does. So we had a, a concert in Nyack, New York, uh, the, a non-existent bar called the Office. H S Club. And and Adam. <laughs> Adam's their local. Those are Adam. Local. Adam. Adam, played there. <laughs> Adam lived in Nyack, and so through these other mutual friends, we invited him to bring his bass to the gig. We never met him before, and he showed up and just completely blew our minds. I mean, it was just remarkable. And here's this kid, maybe 17 years old, intuitively got what we'd been working with for a number of years. And it, it was remarkable. I mean, on so many levels, he just instantly got our aesthetic mm -hmm. and, and, and added to it, which was even more remarkable. So he became a, a working, the trio became a quartet at that point. Mm -hmm. And we were all were quite stunned. And I think, as I think we were saying last night, it was like, we all just like looked at each other and go, this kid's a natural. And we all we all kind of looked at each other. We go, agreed. Mm. Let's try this. So what happened? He he was in a member for a period of time, and then what happened? He free spirit. He went off. Continued. Ended up as a guitar player for the Missing Foundation for a long time. Um, and then Sunburn moved to California for a while uh -huh. for a year. Or so oh. and then he girlfriend. was a member of Sunburn Hunt the Man, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. towards the end of his life. Yeah. And he passed away when was it last year? A couple or? of years ago. Yeah. You know, I think it's two, two years, years ago. Two or three years. Right. Uh -huh. Yeah, a phenomenal, phenomenal player. Um, this, you Actually, know, Brian he passed away in 2005. Mm, okay. Was it really? Yeah. Wow. No, it wasn't that. 2005. 2008, sorry. Yeah, 2008, yeah, that sounds more like it. I mean, many people might have probably encountered Borby to Magus or came across the name perhaps via Sonic Youth. You know, Sonic Youth were always big boosters, particularly Thurston, but I believe, was it perhaps, there's a record called Barefoot in the Head, which is Jim... Don and Thurston Moore. Can you tell me a little bit about that happened? I mean, I believe that's probably Thurston's first recorded piece of free playing, if you like, is it? I, my I understanding so. is that that's mm -hmm. Thurston's foray into uh, f free improvisation uh, at the behest, I think, of uh, Byron Coley and uh, Jimmy Johnson from Forced Exposure at that point. They, I think, I think they, 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 they had a relationship with Thurston for a, quite some time. And being fans of Borbito, they they seem to take delight in the pulling some strings and seeing what Borbito Magus would be like minus Donald and and adding Thurston. And hey, was it? Yeah, yeah it, was it was okay. Good. Well, I mean, it was worth a try. You know, <laughs> I think uh, it worked out pretty well. And of course, Sonic Youth later returned the favor, and Borbito Magus appear on. Um, is it Murray Street? Sonic Youth yeah, record? No, no, no. Well, Jim and I yeah, yeah, played on that. For about 10 seconds. Yeah, for, for two minutes. <laughs> yeah. I think it's less than that. I mean, it's just like... Like that. The end. You know, that was, <laughs> they get big credits. They, 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 it really got... You guys probably recorded for 
you said what a couple like each couple of hours or something and well we we, we we recorded for minutes i mean we we jammed uh with uh lee and thurston and uh, and uh, jim o'rourke uh, for for some time after that but that's i mean the actual recording was nothing Really? A minute, two minutes. No, we were playing, we were adding, dubbing in our track. So we mentioned, we talked about the the, the, um, the, the hook up with Japanese noise. I mean, Burby and Megas did become very popular with the Japanese underground. I believe you were even uh, on the Alchemy calendar as pin up boys for, uh, That's true. for, for one month. <laughs> <clears throat> and you also played with Hydro Caden. Yes. Yeah. And, we, and, and you know, Jojo would sit in, in with us at various gigs. Both in both in Japan and in New York as well. Well, he, he had brought some alchemy artists to the CMJ right. uh, event in New York, and uh, we did a bill at the in the Knitting Factory basement. Yeah, the Alchemy Theater. That was really the first time we played with him, I believe. And well, uh, I don't think we actually played with him. We were just all right, in the same bill, but we all got to be friends. Right. Yes, right. Yeah. <laughs> they were in New York and then uh, actually were all hanging out very close to where I worked so I could go over and visit their booth you know during the day and, and then shortly after that um, they were they had us uh, to Japan so in 96 we, we played in Japan for the first wow, time wow it was, a, it was phenomenal unbelievable <laughs> was the, well that live great. in Tokyo yeah there's CD a CD document that documents that, yeah. the concert well, there Coming, coming from a, a history in the States of having no one in our audience. I mean, this is a great audience, by the way. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Yes. I mean, we've, we've performed, and I'm not happy or proud to say this, but we've performed concerts for as little as Zero. a cardboard cutout. Zero. <laughs> Zero people. That was, that was important to Rudolph Gray. Those sometimes. You know, was Scott McCauley that was like that, you yeah. know. And so we imagine our surprise as we're walking to the, the venue, and there's this long line of people wrapped around the block, and the woman who is escorting us, I, we're, we're walking, and the line just keeps going and going, and I said, you know, they having a sale here? <laughs> <laughs> and she said, no, they're for you. <laughs> So that was a, that was really really remarkable. I mean, it was a, a first for us for the, sure. The other thing though was JoJo knew our aesthetic, appreciated our aesthetic, and gave us everything we needed at every gig that he helped arrange. So there was never an issue with the sound people. To there was never a fight. Right. Uh, he he knew exactly what we needed and provided it, and it gave us everything to make. Some of the most amazing music. So that was that was also a thrill because we're so often fighting with sound guys who, you know, will do a sound check with you, and then the minute you start playing, it's like turn these guys down. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> well, you said earlier on you, you were unsure about how you connected with the sort of Japanese noise culture. So how did you go on when you actually arrived in Japan and were kind of embraced by this new noise culture? And you were playing with Hydro Kaden. Did you feel that they were contemporaries and pe that you had something in common with at this point? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we shared a, 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 a big, a large enthusiasm for what we're doing. And, and that enthusiasm, regardless of what, what, it's, what their specific aesthetic is, I mean, you have to acknowledge it for what it is, which is a commitment to, the, to their music, which is admirable. Mm -hmm. And big ups to anybody who can do that and sustain that for any length of time. Same thing with voice crack. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's 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 not the same aesthetic as as what we do, but it's still remarkable and needs to be applauded. So you know, there's a sort of kinship with anybody who's got that dedication. Yeah, I, I think there, there were people in the audience at the show in Tokyo that I mean, people came up to us before the show or after the show, and was like. How come it's taking you so long to get here? I've been waiting for you. I've been waiting for years to see you guys, you know. And the, and one of the and of course the answer is well, you know, you need to be invited. It's a long way to go to crash yeah. a party. Yeah. But the one one guy in the audience had our first a, a copy of our first album, which we put out in, as a run of four hundred. So I mean, it was just amazing. And he wanted us to autograph it. And it was like he'd been waiting for us to come to Japan. To, to be able to autograph this album that he had since it came out in 1980, and it was 
just so cool in a way that, you know, one of these 400 records had found its way to someone who treasured it, you know, mm -hmm. in the way that he did. We felt we've, we've been very fortunate in, in uh, as the more uh, distant years began to melt away of being embraced by certain musical scenes in Europe, being embraced by the, the, the noise scene in Japan, also the, the noise rock scene in uh, New York City, in uh, the sort of the Sonic Youth Swan situation. A lot of the bands that were in that particular scene were very fond of us as well. And there was a period in the late 80s and early 90s where we were not able to play at the Knitting Factory, but found a home to CBGB's. And we played there play. with that wonderful sound system regularly. I know we were sharing bills with a lot of those bands. And, you know, live, be basically being a denizen of the Lower East Side myself, then, you know, they all became drinking buddies and so forth. Yeah, and it addresses your earlier point about jazz. And, and the fact of the matter is, these people were sort of kindred spirits. They're, they were playing clearly in a genre that they felt comfortable with, which is rock. Mm -hmm. um, earlier, we had friends who played jazz. But it was, it was all coming from the same in source. I mean, these are people with great integrity mm -hmm. who were very serious about what they were doing, um, but perhaps weren't, you know, they, they felt a certain sense of comfort playing rock or jazz or whatever, and that's fine. Um, I think that our personalities, our individual personalities are somewhat disruptive. Uh, probably as children, and it's manifesting itself in our <laughs> in our music. You yeah. know, I mean, people. I and on some level, I think it's sort of delightful to tell stories about how foolish people are that they they would pull a plug on something as wonderful and <laughs> life affirming as what we yeah. do. Yeah, yeah it's funny, life affirming. But I think that people often can mistake. Um, something that's noisy or aggressive as being, yeah, sort of, that it couldn't possibly be positive or celebratory. It always needs to be, like, angry or protesting or something like that. It's a very simplistic view. And I think the other problem with using terms like noise, especially when you use it with a group like Borbita and Megas, is, as we've, we've touched on, yeah, and it undermines any sort of musicianship. Noise sort of seems like you're just making a noise rather than there's any playing. Right. But, of course, all the great noise groups were actually had really iconic, great iconoclastic players on them, you know. Yeah, we've we've actually fought against the the the, 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 the term and the pigeonhole of noise since we were first had, had it thrown at us. Um, but there seems to be no battling it down, you know. It's sort of like I think it the Russian yeah. army devouring the you know the the, the Germans with you know the, the the ants on the elephant type of thing. You just can't get rid of it, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, I also well, think that, and this is worthy of, of repeat because we've we've used this before. There was a record store. Remember record stores? Mm -hmm. um, There's a big record store chain called Tower Records. And the th interesting thing about Tower is that each section, classical, rock, etc., they had their own buyers, who, whomever was hired to manage that particular section of the store w was given free reign to buy records or stock records that they liked, that they thought were representative of the, of the genre in which they were working. So I can remember Donald telling us that the, the downtown Tower Records had our records in... in the rock section, the classical electronic <laughs> section, the jazz section, the weird all other section. Other. So, yeah, all, so other. all of these, in that particular store, we were blessed with buyers who were fans of the group, but in their mind, we were modern classical, or we were jazz, or we were rock, or we were hardcore, or fill in the blank, or the weird all others, my personal favorite. Yeah. Actually, probably, I, the, I think the best one was the, the one up by, by, uh, by Lincoln Center, the Tower Records there. We were down in the classical um, department, but right as you came in, they had their own off bin, which was all basically downtown New York music and other you know, unclassifiable avant-garde. So it was any, you know, anything from uh, from uh, I don't know. Uh, Glenn Franca. Well, he was usually upstairs. I'm thinking more like <laughs> Meredith Monk okay. and us 
you know, it's wow. the same, you know, in the same, in the same section, you know. Um, well, you mentioned it's kind of fun that you don't have to play to an audience with a single cardboard cutout anymore. And um, so, do you th- what happened? Has Borby Omega's time come? Has has persistence paid off? Has the culture ch- de- deformed enough that they can now accept something like Borby Omega's? Do we look like it? It seems. So. <laughs> <laughs> do you look deformed? <laughs> what do you guys think? No, I think things have definitely changed. In and what way? I mean, to, well, I think there there seems to be more of an embrace of, of this noise. We, uh, we must music. be we must be slacking off. <laughs> I, mean, yeah, I, would, I, would, I mean, yes, we uh, surviving at what you do and, and never compromising is you know an old handle. It's a long term advice, and, um, and we didn't really need it, but I've, you know I've gotten it from great. Great, great people, uh, but we didn't really need it. That's what we were going to do anyway. Um, and mm, looking back, um, there was actually that sort of almost a—I rena- don't want to say renaissance necessarily—but there was a very, very. There was a good period when Sonic Youth was on top of things, and there was this great trickle down of their word of yeah. mouth about people uh-huh. that gave a lot of oomph to things. Now. The one problem that we encountered, because we probably weren't part of the noise rock scene, um, and one of the reasons that was another, instead of to keep the band going, in my own mind, just to give people an opportunity to say that they actually saw us, was that I was consistently running into younger people in their 20s who would meet me. Uh, This is all in like the late 90s and early 2000s, even in New Orleans. They're like, oh my God, you're Donald Miller. You're a Borbera Magus. I've heard you're amazing. <laughs> Not, I've heard you and you are amazing. <laughs> and, and time after time after time. And, you know, you didn't meet 10 of these to the one person you say like, oh yeah, I saw you at, at ABC No Rio or I saw you at CBGB's or oh, I saw you in London or, you know. And it was really one out of 10 or 11 or 12 the others would be like, I've heard you guys are amazing. Well, the CDs are out there. The economy is good, or most of the time. You know, it, it, yeah. it, was, it, was, it was nice. You know, it got us gigs. It got us more money for the gigs. That was all very nice. And people at least were aware of us. And that seems to have dropped off with, like, the current generation of, like, the, you know, the neo-hipster foho, yeah. you know, self-absorbed... Slub, <laughs> who you know, just who I mean, you know, and you, you, I, there are these kids in New Orleans who like do noise music, and they all think that they invented it. I swear to God, <laughs> they're all like twenty-two, like oh, I play do noise, no, I invented this. Uh, I, there are a lot of them. <laughs> Well, I mean, we're all going to get a chance to see the inventors of noise later on tonight. I mean, at this point, I'll keep open it to the floor a little bit. I don't know if anyone else has got any questions they might want to ask for being Megas at all. If you haven't, don't worry. Don't be shy. Not a single question. I do have to pee, so we could cry. <laughs> well, I just want to ask you one thing. What, 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 a board to make his performance, is it completely improvised? Is there ever any discussion as to what you're going to do? or is it? We tried. We thought about it a long time ago, and I just like went out the window. No, Sometimes, I mean, whatever, whatever you, you, you can have discussions, or you can come to it with a, a sort of idea of something you want to try. But in, in, inevitably, once, that, once the yeah. music hits, anything that you had thought you were going to do is completely out the window, and you, and, and you find yourself in unfamiliar terrain and dealing with things that are either musically challenging because somebody is playing something that you're not expecting, or technical challenges where your amp blows or b- catches on fire, or <laughs> the acoustics of Does the room... Does that happen a lot? Did you catch yeah, on that fire actually a happened a number of times. Little Jimmy Firestarter. <laughs> a period of time where I seem to be the one always setting... <laughs> Little <up>. Jimmy Firestarter. <laughs> and you can always see it in the time. That was that old familiar smell of burning beard. <laughs> there was a period there where it was getting to be a bad, getting to be a bad habit. Um, yeah, but it's yeah again. But, and then there are there are, you know there are issues with the aforementioned sound man who decides he doesn't really can't relate to this and is doing the audience a favor by turning you down to the point where you're inaudible 
or <laughs> turning your monitors off so you can't even hear yourself or what everybody else is playing. Wow. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's an environmental type music. It's, it, it is improvised, but it's, it's incredible. The, the space that you perform in actually has a huge impact ultimately on the music that mm -hmm. you play. We played a concert the first time uh, 30 years ago this month uh, in London, actually, at a festival. Um, and it was really great because we, we were playing bell. Jim and I were playing uh, bells together. And we hit a frequency that was just exquisitely painful. It was, it was absolutely <laughs> marvelous. And, and, and we, we got the sound. It was a very, lo very large hall. And this, it was, we, we created a sort of sonic vortex in the room. And I mean, it was the, the it was like almost like Dumb listening ceiling. to the like one frequency breaking itself, very high frequency, sort of breaking apart, coming together, and it was ricocheting off the walls, and it was just amazing. And at one point, I looked, and there was no one left seated in my place. Then we cleared the hall; there was no one left. <laughs> Wow. But it was too good to let go of. I mean, and we just, <laughs> you know, it's just like when. Well, that's what those no, are the moments that were you were. That's constantly what, we, that's the concert we yeah. wanted to be in the audience. Yeah. And when you when you find those, you you have hit new terrain. You know, you're you're. you're so where how, you does it, how does it feel? Well, there's a they give you an idea of a oh. progression. We did this again in Oakland and in, in, in a bar in Oakland. Uh, like on our first trip out to to the you know, the Bay Area years later, and we. All hit the three of us hit that, and it was gorgeous and it was thoroughly sadistic. And we held it for um, I think at least 10 minutes, and we still kept the audience for the most part. Wow, big difference there. Yeah, because I, I was going to ask, how does it feel to be in the, the eye of that storm? Because I mean, I've seen Barbie make as many times, and there are points, as you talk about, where it just feels like this complete sort of tingling body ecstasy that you get. How does it feel to be in the centre of creating that music? Fatherhood. Yeah, feels, Fatherhood. Feels, <laughs> and, well, I, I think the thing is that we're, we can start to get lost in it ourselves. Yeah. And then I think your sense of time is a little bit right. out of whack. So... I think quite often I'll, I'll like feel like, well, God, we got to go. That idea is really working great, but let's change it to something else. So one of us will sort of dive somewhere else, and then the sound will either move to that or you'll have several things going on. So you, we'll never stay with – to stay with something like that for 10 minutes is, is unusual. It was unusual. Because it's, it's much I more delighted. rapid it was, I was delighted that – I was delighted that – I mean, you know – But I, we also did something like that, that. in, in – thinking this more carefully, we played in a, a squat in Geneva some years ago, and, oh, and we had a ago. lot, Jim and I were foolishly in the habit really of nice. bringing lots of horns with us, and so we were playing, again, a, seems like this is the, the leitmotif of this conversation, but we were playing a, a bells together with two baritone saxes, so it was this really low foghorn. And we, we have a cassette copy of it somewhere, and it was just this drone, this like low woof, like rumbling with the sound, <laughs> but really very low pitch. Uh -huh. And it went for almost a half hour. Wow. And it was just like, whoa. whoa. <laughs> <laughs> and you had to be very careful because this was in the basement of, of the, the sort of the, the, the basement bar of the squat. And um, it was also above the septic tank for the building. Oh, and there was actually a, a, square, a square hole <laughs> in the stage <laughs> that was looking down into the entire sewage output of like the entire block squat. <laughs> That's where it's and not too you, safe to lose yourself in the music too much. <laughs> <laughs> you might lose yourself completely. Yeah. It'd be like the scene of the camera and I fell on this shit, you know. Like that, uh, but yeah, I think as far as like the planning thing goes, it's basically like warfare. You can play as much strategy as you can put into it and you can have all the intel about the beachhead and so forth that you're going to invade and as soon as you launch the troops everything falls to fucking shit you know like yeah that's basically it it's like okay we've got a strategy if it appears somehow in the music which it probably is it's a mindset but basically everything is every man for himself but for one common goal but you're heading for that zone the vortex yeah yeah, I'm yeah, trying to make sense of something. 
We have we have we have we have the tools. Whether we have the plan or not is sort of is 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 is, uh, is not necessary. Well, once once you hit once you hit the mother load, you got to keep going. Not okay, right. You hit the, you, you hit the that that that, that gold vein. You just gotta, it doesn't you happen. Ride it that. doesn't happen all the time, and we're all and we all know it. We're all very disappointed. In but you know what? When you hit it as well, you know it when when you're on. You know it when you get there. Oh, totally. Oh yeah. Yeah, uh, and, and, and very and very rarely is there any, and very very rarely is there any um, like well no I got off you know but I didn't or anything <laughs> like that you know, it's usually all three of us get off or we don't you know it's well, I mean, good a, sex a or classic bad. example was when we played at La Mama in Japan in Tokyo and we hit this point and all of a sudden it, it, there were like audible uh, 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 spotlights like. Uh, Polaroids, flashes, poof, pop, 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 and we're playing this thing, and bang, 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 and, and it was, what it was was we were blowing the speakers out of the, this very expensive oh, PA, wow. and we hit this this really like this again we hit we hit the mother load and we we're just riding the big wave, and as we're we catch this groove and it just we're just riding this all of a sudden there's this percussion now we don't. We didn't start playing with a percussionist, but all of a sudden you hear, dish, 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 dish. and the speakers, are this, this million, million dollar sound system, <laughs> are, are frying while, during the performance. And, and it's, uh, that was released on Live in Tokyo, by the way. Beautiful. And well captured. Yeah. Great. Well, look forward to later on tonight, see if we can hit the golden vein, the mother load, yeah, yeah, the yeah, vortex. The mother load. Right. There. So anyway, uh, let's thank Borby and Megas. Thanks very much, guys. Right. And, when you, and when you can, and when you see him later, you can also thank Jojo because he's the one who picked up the tab for the speakers that we blew up. That's right. Cheers, Jojo.